So hi everyone, and thank you for joining our call today. And uh, Maxime, just go ahead. I think. Yeah. Hi everybody. Uh, today uh, we don't have really a single topic. It's more like two topics which are interconnected. First, I would like to give a demo of a thing we call Descriptor Wallet. It's a library developed by LNP BP Association, supporting everything that is necessary to create a wallet working with a, a single use sales, Lightning Network, Miniscript, Taproot, uh, multi six, arbitrary complex Bitcoin stuff. And uh, this library is actually used by ourselves to do a layers on top, including the stuff we are doing for Lightning Network, uh, Lightning Node, uh, Bfrost, uh, RGB Node, and so on and so forth. So Descriptor Wallet is not a fully fledged wallet that will support RGB. Uh, Descriptor Wallet is a library using which you can build your wallet supporting RGB. But of course, you will need to add RGB libraries as well. So it's more like a foundation thing uh, which uh, is useful not only in the rgb world but in the general uh, bitcoin world because uh, as we found and it was the reason why we worked on this library uh, is the fact that there is no wallet library as of today uh, having the qualities that we need for ourselves and i will be while I'll be describing the descriptor wallet, I will get in touch what are these qualities. So I would like to, to, to say a few words about that uh, wallet library. And then I will give a demo because this library also provides two binaries, command line binaries, which allows you to do all the Bitcoin magic uh, with everything. Miniscript, uproot, uh, tweaks of public keys and all of that kind of stuff. So I'd like to show how it, it all works. And then, right from there, I would like to move into the second topic, which is quite interconnected to the first one. It's basically a question of these different forms of tweaks, which are used by RGB protocol, but not only RGB protocol, many other protocols, uh, including those who are based on single use seals in the future, will be based in the, on the single use seals in the future, and those who are not, because pay to contract and sign to contract tweaks are used much before uh, the invention of RGB. Uh, and they actually present a lot of challenges. And these challenges were partially addressed by us uh, in the Descriptor Wallet Library. And one of the, they were one of the reasons that we had to develop our own dedicated uh, Bitcoin Wallet Library. Because any other library doesn't allow you to work with this sign to contract and pay to contract tweaks. Uh, but also, we already started the discussion about the use of pay to contract and sign to contract in uh, RGB and in single use seals last call. And we found uh, several challenges which we discussed and found some solutions. And today I would like to continue that discussion because there are more challenges specifically related to some sign to contract. So I would like to walk through them, ask the community opinion and uh, request for comments on these topics. So that's, that's the agenda for today. And uh, I can start, but I would like to check with everybody here that there is nothing else you would like to discuss and there is no questions appearing so far. Okay, it seems that there is no questions. So, Descriptor Wallet is a library, uh, first of all, Rust library, uh, and uh, also two command line tools to work with the uh, wallets, uh, which we will never uh, position like a ready to go wallet. It's more like pro professional tools for, for hacking into Bitcoin with the wallet capabilities. Because the Scripture Wallet library is not a library with which you can 
just out of the box work with a Lightning Network or RGB. You will need a layer on top of that. And actually that layer is presented by the stuff we are doing in LMP core and RGB core and uh, in the products, which we are doing LMP node and RGB node, you will have basically an assembly of descriptor wallet uh, together with the Lightning and RGB specific all functionality. But the descriptor wallet is a foundation layer that allows you to work with the stuff which is required by RGB, in particular pay to contract fees, the stuff required by Bifrost, like Taproot, very deep Taproot specific stuff. And on top, even on top of that, uh, there is a wallet that we actually developed that is a consumer facing, facing wallet. We developed it, it not the nonprofit association, but in my company, it called My Citadel Wallet. And actually, it integrates just all of these parts uh, LNP node, RGB node, uh, descriptor wallet library, uh, signer specific functionality into a single. Uh, binary with a user interface. So basically we showcase with the MySitter wallet how the descriptor wallet and other products we are developing can be utilized to build a consumer facing software supporting everything that exists uh, in the censorship uh, resistant world of Bitcoin ecosystem with layers on top of it, including Lightning Network, RGB. Uh, so, uh, why did we need this descriptor wallet thing? Well, here is a small comparison chart uh, where we show the most used uh, existing wallet libraries, uh, namely Bitcoin Dev Kit, the Rust library developed quite recently by Alekos Fellini and uh, Ricardo Casati and other uh, guys. Uh, quite advanced one. Uh, and the, our initial idea were, was that we will be able to do most of things we need with the Bitcoin Dev Kit and we don't need to develop our own wallet library. Unfortunately, it was not the case because there were three really important things that are missed from Bitcoin Dev Kit and which we really require. First, it's a complete hot uh, cold wallet isolation such that you can guarantee that you can work with the wallet without ever touching a um, private keys, derive all the addresses and everything that is required and having uh, the derivation path, for instance, that can be, uh, that can always be derived without accessing private keys. Unfortunately, Bitcoin the kit doesn't provide such guarantees. Uh, the second thing that we really need is, and even more important is uh, pay to contract and sign to contract tweaks which completely unsupported by Bitcoin Dev Kit. Uh, there is also no Lightning compatibility in Bitcoin Dev Kit, which we hardly, which we heavily require. And uh, other smaller things like custom C hashes and input descriptors, which uh, input descriptors are also related to the paid to contract picks. I will be talking about them later. So we had to do a wallet library that supports all of that. Uh, unfortunately, the rest of the libraries on the market, they are non-Rust based, they are C based libraries and other libraries which are not even C based, but like JavaScript and, and so on and so forth, they are utilizing usually C libvalley libraries, so they just inherit uh, the same restrictions. And here you see that this, I would call them legacy library, doesn't support nothing that we need to. Like output descriptors, no, mini script, no, taproot, no, and so on and so forth. So it's it's quite quite unfortunate that uh, they doesn't uh, provide an, a way to develop modern uh, Bitcoin libraries, and it was one of the main reasons why Bitcoin Dev Kit was created. And unfortunately, the main reason why we also had to develop the wallet uh, library as well. Uh, as an introduction, just to show you the complexity of the Bitcoin development, uh, if you would like to support everything that exists in the foundation Bitcoin layer, in the layer one of the Bitcoin blockchain, you have to support many, many other uh, different things which appear throughout the softworks like SegWit and then Taproot, for instance, just as scripts. Uh, defining a spending conditions, they require you to work with all these different forms of scripting 
and data types related to scripts. Like if you count here, you will see more than 10 different data types and data structures that have to be covered. Of course, nearly none of the existing libraries do that, except of uh, Bitcoin DevKit. Basically, most of these types are defined in the Rust Bitcoin. And what it was one part of our contribution to Rust Bitcoin as well, but also of others. Uh, and uh, some of these types are introduced at Descriptor Wallet Library. Uh, the, we are planning to migrate them into Rust Bitcoin, but it will take more time. But at least they are accessible through the Descriptor Wallet Library. And uh, before going to demo, I would like to put a structure into what a Bitcoin wallet is as of today, taking into account all different forms of advanced wallet setups that you can use today for working not just with a normal Bitcoin, but also with a taproot, also with RGB. And uh, here on this chart, there will be a blocks, building blocks of the wallet. And these blocks are can be classified into three categories. The first category shown in red is actually, no, no, I will start with the orange color. The orange color is Bitcoin part. It's part that is stored in the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, so anything that, can ha that has access to Bitcoin blockchain actually can see and retrieve this information. So Electrum server, Bitcoin core, and any wallet. Uh, so you don't need to store the copy of this information uh, outside of your fully validated node. So fully, having fully validated node actually solves the problem of having that information locally, validating that information, and accessing to that information. So it's not that large problem, but uh, it's just an information you have to work with. That's an orange color. The two other colors, uh, red and blue, are more complex things. And actually, that's where the wallet uh, software has its main focus. Because again, on chain parts, the wallet needs on chain part, but it's usually accessed through Electrum server or through talking to Bitcoin core node. And the wallet doesn't need to manage that part by itself, it's just accessing that part. Uh, the two other parts are classified into category of the information that can be uh, recovered if lost. So this is information that wallet has to be really careful about, the information that has to be backed up, and uh, the information that... Uh, Sometimes it's critical in terms of if you lose, the, if you leak this information, you may lose your funds. The sec it's this category is shown in red, and the third category is actual information that is managed by the wallet, uh, which uh, but this information is deducible. I mean that it is information derived from other parts, like on-chain data and this unrecoverable important data. Uh, this information can be derived by the wallet software. And while it may take time, so it's better to cache this data and keep them, uh, if this data are lost, it's not a highly critical thing. The only thing that you will lose is some time to deduce this information by scanning blockchain or deriving different, uh, trying to derive many, many multiple duration paths and so on. So basically it's a cache, information cached by wallets. And uh, this slide demonstrates how we structured the, the hierarchy of information in Descriptor Wallet. It's a bit different from how other wallets do this because they miss some of the parts. In particular, the main part that they miss is a part related to pay-to-contract tweaks because none of the wallet library works with the pay-to-contract fix. Uh, so this is one of the main change, changes that we introduce here. The second change is the change required for distinguishing cold and hot wallets. Because our wallet at the very fundamental level um, distinguish uh, situation where you need access to the private keys by creating signatures from the situations, from all the rest situations, and it aims at having the full wallet you're normally working with 
uh, that will be able to present you all the information without touching private keys, such that even if you do the payment, you end up with a, having a PSBT created, partially signed Bitcoin transaction without signature. And then the uh, PSBT is sent to the hardware wallet or external service or whenever you need to air gap device such that you can create a signature for it independently and frequently um, asynchronously and so on and so forth. So we, we put a strong emphasis on the distinctions of the parts of the wallet that ever never touch the private keys and those which work with the private keys and do not do anything else than just creating signatures or doing a hard, uh, hardened derivations. Uh, so because we needed to discuss, distinguish these two things, we had to introduce another thing which we called a tracking account. And uh, the tracking account, uh, I will be talking about it in a moment. It's basically a wallet account that is able to track uh, addresses on chain without having access to the private keys. So let's, let's start with this hierarchy. And probably after this slide, I will do a small break before the demo to answer the questions because this slide is really complex and I would like everybody to understand its meaning before showing how it works in practice. So any wallet, including descriptor wallet, starts with the seed or uh, master public, uh, master private key. Uh, the seed is generated out of entropy, out of randomness. And that seed can be encoded as 12 or 15 or 16 or 24. Uh, words, and basically it's it's just random data that you have to back up and store unless, uh, because otherwise you may lose all your assets and everything related to this seed. And instantly this seed actually creates a private uh, extended master private key. And from out from that extended master private key, you can generate extended master public key as well. So, uh, we start with the seed, and the seed is managed by the uh, hot wallet, uh, which should run on air gap device, or it may be even a hardware wallet. And, and in that case, it's not that hot wallet, but basically, it's, it's a different part. Uh, sorry, is somebody going to say something? Hearing some sounds. Oops, sorry, I'll mute myself. No, no, no problem. And the seed should be shared actually the whole idea that you will have the single seat nearly for all of your wallets across different devices and across different use cases uh, across uh, everything because the seat is a really important and valuable thing you have to set up a very complex world for it you may have a proper backups for for it and so on and so forth and doing that each time you create a wallet it's just craziness it's it's impossible to do so the idea that you generate seed once and only once probably you will generate seed not with a descriptor wallet library at all you will use some hardware setup or something really dedicated for that purpose and that is really recommended so you you will store it and keep it never touched somewhere. So how you will work with wallets uh, if you have this untouchable seat? Well, there is a concept that we call assigning wallet account. You can call it differently and other software call it uh, in many, many different ways. But basically signing account is a extended private key, which is not master. This is a private key that is being derived from the seat using some derivation path. And basically, that's what we call wallet by itself, per se. It's a specific extended private key that can sign transactions and that can actually control the certain scope of uh, your use cases. So when you have a seat, um, you actually create a dedicated signing account for different circumstances, like managing your own funds, keeping your own funds that you are frequently used to pay some services, keeping your savings, 
funds, it's another signing account. Having your family account with a multi-sig setup, you use another signing account derived from the same seed. Uh, seed. Or if you have a company uh, where you take decisions and which also operates in Bitcoins, you will derive a separate signing account for each roles and each of the companies where you're participating in. So in this way, you can use the same and reutilize the same seed to control multiple wallets under multiple circumstances. And that's what I show that from single seat you can derive arbitrary number of signing accounts. You have to see this one to uh, it, uh, to indefinite uh, relation between seat and signing account on the chart. Uh, the problem with the signing account that first of all you can lose it because you can always free derive the private key out of the seat, but the problem that it's really. Uh, uh, security critical information because if you will lose your extended private key, you will lose all the funds related to that wallet account. So the signing account information should be kept as well probably on the hardware device or on the air gap device and managed by a hot wallet setup. And uh, whatever you would like to work with a uh, wallet normal wallet, you should not touch the signing account information. You should not touch the extended private key. You should be able to track your funds without touching private key. You should be able to create a spending transaction without to construct it without touching private key. And when you will need to sign it, you will forward this transaction for signing to the hardware device or to air gap device. And for that, you will need a concept that we call a tracking account. And the tracking account is basically an one-to-one uh, -one equivalent of the signing account with the only one difference, the tracking account is about extended public key, not the private key. So with the tracking account, you have a read-only wallet. You can't sign anything, but you can track on chain status and you can also um, create uh, unsigned transactions, which will be later signed by a signing account. So this is differentiation that we introduce in descriptor wallet library, and that is which is not present in this form in any other library as we as far as we know, such that uh, read-only accounts are fully separated from uh, hot accounts, and that you would not be able even to construct a wallet with a signing account. You will be you will need to adjust uh, a public key, extended public key. And the specificity specificity of the tracking account is that it doesn't use any hardened derivation path fragments because hardened derivation path fragments they require access to the private key. So tracking account is actually generated from the signing account with a very specific derivation path up to the last hardened uh, path component. And it still will operate multiple public keys and will be able to create multiple addresses for different use cases. But these addresses will be derived with unhardened derivation path. And we call this part of the derivation path, the ending part, which is always a hardened a terminal path, the ending path. And uh, next to the tracking account, the next concept we are working with is a wallet descriptor. It's quite a no novel concept introduced by Bitcoin Core when they created descriptor-based uh, uh, wallets and later used by Bitcoin DevKit. And we use it as well. So basically a wallet itself is not just a extended public key because you may have a multi-sig wallet which uses multiple extended public keys. So the wallet descriptor is different from the specific tracking account because specific tracking account is just a single extended public key with a derivation path it used uh, to derive specific public keys for different addresses. And the wallet descriptor is the way you combine multiple public keys derived from the different probably tracking account into specific uh, combination that can be used to generate wallet address. And uh, with wallet descriptor, you generate specific output descriptors, which actually specify the way, like, do you use a, a pay to witness script hash or pay to script hash or pay to taproot and so on and so forth. So these are wallet descriptors. And probably I will move to the demo at this point. 
well, first questions and then demo, because to talk about terminals, tweaks and output descriptor, I need just to show you how you can do the first part of this thing. So while I will be switching, I propose everybody to ask uh, the questions if, if you have any. Any questions, guys? Hi, I have a question. A question about uh, what are exactly input descriptors? Oh, we will move to the input descriptors a bit later uh, because uh, I need to explain other parts before talking about that. So I will be showing them uh, directly and explaining them during the um, demonstration. Okay. So I'm connecting to the server. There was also a comment. Um, yeah, there was also a comment that in BDK you can drive public descriptor for use in an internet connected computer. Inside it was what? about the slide when you had the comparison. Uh, there was a comment on the slide yeah. when you, where you had the comparison in between different libraries. Mm -hmm. So the comment is in BDK, you can derive public descriptor for use in an internet connected computer. Well, uh, yes, you can do this and many other things in, in, in the BDK. I'm just not getting why, uh, how this comment related to, uh, to the slide, because I wasn't saying that you can't do that. I was saying that you can't, uh, if you have a hardened path, hardened path components, you will actually need access to the, uh, to the private key. And you can't derive a, a specific uh, descriptor without uh, making sure that uh, it wouldn't fail if you don't provide it with a private keys. Yeah, yeah. If, if somebody, somebody was willing to say something about that, you, you're welcome. Well, I, I didn't understand the last comment, but. Um... Um, with, when you derive a public part, you can separate the hot and cold. No, you can't. That's the whole point. That, uh, well, you can separate them, but uh, nothing will guarantee you that the cold poly part will be working well. Because if the derivation path contains hardened components, the uh, cold part wouldn't be able to derive the addresses and track on chain information. And each time you will need to connect the cold part, the hot part. You see, like, if you will have this kind of derivation path, I will just type in, if you will have this kind of derivation, derivation path, like this, M, something like 44, uh, zero, uh, one, zero, zero, and you have a, a cold and hot wallet. When you stick it this path into the cold wallet, it will fail because these components they require access to the private key to derive the address, and you wouldn't be able to manage and work with this situation on the level of BDK. Does it uh, so basically you will have a hot and cold wallet, but the cold wallet will not just work. So did did was I able to explain this part? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, so uh the demos demonstration is uh, the current descriptor wallet is not released so you will have to clone the github repository 
Mm, using this part. Uh, I'm sorry, Doctor. Could you please increase the fonts just a little bit more? Uh, I will try to. Right, thank uh, you. I don't know how to do that, actually. Uh, it's keyboard customization. Interesting how to do the fonts. Settings. Probably here. Yeah, here it is. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, is it better? Yep, way better. Thank you. So, we clone this URL. Uh, you go into this repository. And you do a command called cargo install. You need to specify the path, local path. Otherwise, it will try to install the latest release, which doesn't contain all these features I will be talking about. And also, you need to specify all features. Otherwise, you wouldn't get binaries, local binaries. So you, you got the compilation from the source code, the Rust source code. It's not that long. And you see that it uses Rust Bitcoin. It uses strict encoding from client-side validation libraries. It uses Miniscript. It's using Electrum client for Electrum connectivity. It used Bitcoin on chain for uh, tracking on chain part, uh, which is all another uh, library, which is a part of Descriptor Wallet library. And it uses Miniscript, which currently is building. descriptors, partially signed Bitcoin transactions, and so on to false. Come on. Yeah, and it's built. We have two main executables called BTC Cold or BTC Hold, which actually had cold and hot wallet. So if we will see the hot BTC hot command, we will see that we have several commands, including derive, which allows you to derive a, a signing account. This part of the story I was talking before, this signing account. We have a help, of course, the command that helps you, the info command that prints information about existing account or the seat. You have a seed command uh, that allows you to create the seed or and extend it with private keys. And a sign command that allows you to sign existing PSBT created with a cold wallet. So basically that's all the functionality that the hot wallet has. So we can start with a creating seed, but we need to specify a file to have that seed. So I will create a directory called uh, wallet to use everywhere, oh, sorry, make MD. And I will use that directory to derive the uh, seed. And I need to specify some password because the seed is password encoded. So I got a seed derived with this mnemonic. Uh, I got uh, information about extended uh, public and private keys. So this is extended public key, this is fingerprint, and this is account ID, signing account ID. And also it, it did that for both mainnet and testnet, depending where I would like to use it. Uh, so uh, we have a seat, and now let's derive a, uh, a specific uh, signing account. Mm, so derive comment. And it requires me to specify the seed file from which out of which I will be deriving that account and uh, an output which will hold uh, a specific extended private key for that account. So I will call it uh, XPrev. 
Yes, and I also need to specify over the which network I will be deriving. I will be blackless, and I will go with the mainnet. And also, quite sure that it also requires me to specify the derivation path. DC hot derive help. Yeah, it's it asked me to specify either a, a derivation path or a scheme, because if you know. Uh, BAP standards define multiple derivation schemes uh, that are recommended to be used with different uh, types of uh, outputs like page public key hash, witness public key hash, and so on and so forth. The descriptor wallet can, uh, supports all of them, all of the existing BAPs. You see all this list, long list. And also it supports an LNPBP standard, which we developed, which allows you to built an identity-based wallet utilizing, uh, which are universal and support different uh, taproot and multi six and all the setups. And also they support single use seals to revocate for revocation of identities. Uh, I had a um, mail to Bitcoin that list that describes how this thing is working. Or you can create a custom derivation path with a M and full derivation path. So for now I will uh, use a scheme for doing wallet derivation, which is stop root scheme. Uh, BIP 4086. 86. And I will use it uh, and I will call it a uh, top root account. I just need to sign and specify proper flag. Here we are, we have a signing wallet and it also suggests which a specific wallet descriptor I should use. Of course, I can use different one, but uh, this is a recommendation that I may use for creating a cold wallet, uh, tracking the information for this uh, signing account I just created. Uh, how to select here on the iPad? I never used uh, the command line from the iPad, so it's the first time I'm doing that. Let me see. Oh, it's possible. Interesting. I need to copy the string. Select. It works. Interesting. Okay, so let's go to the um, hot wallet, uh, cold wallet. BTC cold. It has a different set of co comments that allows you to generate addresses, to uh, check the balance, to construct uh, PSBTs, uh, create the actually tracking accounts, finalize PSBT, track the history, inspect existing PSBTs, and so on, so forth, like normal functions of the cold wallet. So we will start with uh, creating a uh, tracking account. And for creating a tracking account, we need to provide it a wallet descriptor and output file where we will save that tracking account. So I am putting this descriptor, which is top root based descriptor with the full derivation path. Uh, and uh, I will save it to the same wallet library, TR uh, wallet, to distinguish it from the uh, signing account. So we just create it now. As we can see, we have the seed, TR private key, and TR wallet trading account. Coming back to presentation. So now we have covered uh, these three parts because basically we created a single sign wallet. So this part, let me show you, uh, this is. This part is actually a tracking account covering a single uh, extended master public key with all options for derivation. And this part starting with a TR is a wallet based off a single tracking account. But of course you can do a wallet that will use a multiple uh, extended public keys and multiple tracking accounts. So this is this relation between the tracking account and wallet descriptor, where you can use multiple uh, tracking accounts to build a single wallet descriptor. Here we don't, do into the, don't go into that complexity. And now 
uh, out of wallet descriptor, we can generate specific output descriptors, which are actually fills in this part with the wildcards. You see it? Uh, two asterisks at the end of the path with a, a specific number. So actually it allows you to create a specific addresses for this wallet. These two asterisks, I will show them. So let's do that, BDC hot. And I need an address common for that. Uh, oh, BTC code, sorry. That is comment, and I can say that uh, do I need to change address, generate a change addresses, how many addresses do I need to generate, and so on and so forth. So I will uh, start with just normal addresses and specify the wallet file I am planning to use. And here are the taproot addresses, uh, which I can pay to to use the wallet. And uh, these actually addresses are generated from this output descriptor, which I can use to create an address or track the on-chain information. I'm not touching this part yet because I will be doing that in just a moment later. For now, I would like to ask, does anybody of you have a Taproot enabled wallet today? I assume that probably not. So what I will do is I will derive a normal word with which I will be able to pay to the startup root addresses. So I will use a different derivation scheme. Called uh, just to pay to witness public key key beep. And save it to oh, use the same seed. As I said, that we can use the same seed to derive different uh, wallets and save it to P, uh, where we pick each. Yeah. They need to say that it's mainnet. Here we are. We have another wallet descriptor, which I will use to create another wallet account with a hot wallet. So here I will use different name and different wallet descriptor. And that's it. And now I can check also addresses for it as well. Yeah, we have the addresses for normal pay to uh, witness seek, uh, witness uh, public key hash. And this is all my, on my net. So uh, is anybody crazy enough uh, to send some real Bitcoins to that uh, address or not? If not, I will do it myself. I am. You can send the address to me. Uh, do you have something uh, at your hands for doing that? Uh, yeah, just give me one sec. I just uh, probably it will be hard to switch to Telegram. Uh, I can send it here in the chat. Would it be okay? Oh, okay. I'm trying to copy the address. Okay. So I just need to give you the address or how, no, how no, much I, I'm, I'm giving you the address it's how much do you need as, as, as small as possible but above the dust limit yes you know how to copy it was copying before and now it's stopped copying uh -huh. I need to do this yes so I'm sending that to the chat. Mm -hmm. Just trying to. Here is the address. Okay. And we can track that mm -hmm. while we are sending. I will say that we can track that address with a check command. 
and check comment also asks me for the uh, wallet file. Uh, wallet, repeating wallet. Yeah, and it works this way. Like it asks the uh, Electrum server about um, known transactions. As, as you see, because we just generated this wallet, no transactions are known. So uh, while we are waiting for the transaction to be sent, we can move a bit further. And I will try to explain this more complex part about terminals and tweaks. So where, when we have uh, derived this wallet descriptor, as I just demonstrated, this is a wallet descriptor part. Uh, here it is. And uh, you see that we're using these two asterisks. And when we derive any specific addresses for that wallet, we have these numbers. It's actually the numbers that are inserted in, instead of these asterisks. So we can use a hierarchical derivation to create multiple addresses and not reuse the addresses. And this is what called terminal path. So when we don't use in change addresses, we're using zero for the first asterisk and then one of these numbers for the second asterisk. And this is specific terminal derivation path, which we are storing in the wallet to keep uh, the information about which addresses we have already used. And this part of the story is usually kept, kept by the most of the wallets uh, to uh, not to reuse the same address. And it's easily deducible from the on-chain information because you can track that the address ever been used or not using blockchain. However, there is a different path of part of the story which requires, uh, which can't be deducible from the on-chain and that is it tweaks. So if you will ever use a wallet with RGB, you will create a pay to contract tweak. And if this tweak uh, tweaks one of your public keys, you will get basically a different address because the public key will be tweaked with this pay to contract tweak. And you wouldn't be able neither to track this address, uh, the wallet, which will not handle this information, will not be able to track that these funds are belonging in fact to you and controlled by one of your public keys and private keys under this specific uh, tracking and signing account. And that's really bad. Even worse that if you will lose this tweak information, you will not be able to ever spend that funds because you will not be able to tweak the signing key with that information and create a proper signature. That's why this is shown in red. And this is part that is being introduced into Descriptor Wallet. And this is part really important for working with RGB. And uh, these tweaks are kept separately. And there is a way how you can provide the wallet with the information about the tweaks that were created outside of this specific wallet. For instance, you use some other wallet and uh, the tweak went into one of your public keys and you need to provide the wallet with that information. And the way you provide wallet with that information is called input descriptor. Because when you want to spend that output containing tweak key, you need to specify the specific derivation terminal you would like to spend for from and also the tweak that you have to use. So that's where these two parts, terminal tweaks and input descriptors are coming from. The other thing that input descriptor introduce is actually ability to specify a custom information about replace by fee, time lock and seek hash type which especially as different SIG test types are not supported by many of the wallets. Here we support all uh, existing SIG hash types, arbitrary combination of them for arbitrary number of inputs. And this is all specified by input descriptor. So the, the way this input descriptor looks is uh, this. You specify the specific output you spent. You specify the derivation path terminal. You specify the tweak in form of uh, 32 uh, byte hash, 
which is applied to a specific key participating in the uh, wallet descriptor, and you provide a fingerprint of this key. So this dead beef is actually a kind of fingerprint for the public key that is being tweaked. You can add information that you would like to use RBF, or you can say that you would like to the transaction to be spent after 10 blocks from now. And you can specify a SIG hash that you would like to use, like SIG hash one, or even SIG hash any one can pay with a one combination. So that is what input descriptor is. And the input descriptor is provided when uh, we would like to construct a transaction to pay. So we use a cold wallet to construct the PSPT. We do that with the construct command. And this command help takes a lot of parameters. Uh, how to use page keys, page up, not working. So I will use less. Uh, basically, it takes uh, the information about input, and this information about input is in input descriptor format. And here you have the manual how the in in input descriptor format can be described, and that's what I was just telling you about, that you are able to specify the tweak, you are able to specify the custom time lock and, uh, and sequence lock, sorry, and uh, custom uh, seek hash types. You are also able to specify custom lock time per whole transaction. And outputs composed of the uh, addresses and amount of satoshis you would like to pay to each of those addresses. Uh, so, Olga, are we, was you able to do a transaction? Transaction has been mined actually already. Okay, let's check that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. So it is uh, oh, wow. 37,000 Satoshis. Uh, how many dollars are that? 20 francs. 20, yeah, 20 francs. 20 francs. Okay. So let's hope that nobody will steal them before we finish the demo because the seed phrase was shown on the screen and anybody now can steal these funds if they work quickly enough, quick enough. But I will try to spend them before them being st stolen. So I will construct uh, again, once again the PSBT. I need to specify input, output, wallet file, PSBT file, and fee I would like to pay. So let's start with the input part. So for the input, we will use a derivation path uh, zero, zero. We are not using tweaks there. Will we use RBF replaced by C? And by default, we're using SIG hash all. Uh, so that's fine. We will use a single output, and that output will be actually a pay to taproot output. So I will generate an address for the pay to taproot output. Uh, TR, love it. Just one. Yeah, this is the wallet I would like to use. Copy once again. This will be an output address, and I will send. Uh, how many satoshis was it? Like ten thousand. I will send ten thousand satoshi straight. Next, I need to specify the wallet file, and I'm specifying the. Uh, cold wallet. Uh, I need to specify the PSBT file I would like to save the information to, PSBT to TR. Uh, just simpler. And also I need to specify a fee I would like to pay. So I would like to pay 250 uh, Satoshis in total. Let's see that something something missed. Uh, input, output, wallet file, PSBT file, and information. Probably I need to put Satoshis here or something like that. Uh, 
there were some issues with the command line I didn't uh, work out yet. Valid output, input out point. Uh, I need to check how the inputs are composed. Um, so input is ticks ID V out. Oh yes, I need to specify transaction ID and V out. And I can see that with the this comment. So basically it asks me which specific transaction I would like to spend copy. Uh, so now I will be using this format for output amount, address amount, yes. Yes, I got the P is BT. Uh, if I will check the directory, I should be able to see that file, 2PR, 2TR, PSBT, yes. And I can actually inspect this PSBT using BTC called wallet. And I will see the whole information about it. So I have a previous uh, output. I have uh, new outputs I'm creating. So I have a change output. And I have pay to top root output, as I can see here. Seek hash all, everything set up. Sequence number is correct for the transaction input. And all the details are filled in. So what I need to do is to sign this transaction and that I can do with a PTC hot wallet. And the signature, for the signature, I just need to specify the uh, wallet I will be used to sign, which is this one. And the PSBT transaction I would like to sign, which is this uh, one. Uh, it will sign everything that it just can sign inside the PSPT with the set of keys from this specific signing account. So that's how it's wor it works. I need to remove the help part. Oh, as usual, something went wrong. Uh, This BT file signing account. Oh yeah, that's that's right. I, I, I need to change the order of the files. Well, it's uh, VP. Okay. Script pub key mismatch. Uh -huh. Something wrong as usual during the demo. Uh, input index doesn't like it. Input previous output zero. Sequence witness can be one with it. So we have this address C thirty eight first output or. To witness public key. Anyway, uh, so probably I wouldn't spend time on uh, debugging right now. Maybe I will create um, uh, different transaction paying to different address just to confirm that uh, this thing works. Uh, I will use again WPKH hash wallet. So let's say this. Output. Okay. Construct. Yes, and I will use different output address. Maybe that will have help. Mm. 
No, it won't. Again, let's try to sign it. Yeah, still doesn't work. Anyway, uh, unfortunately, there is certainly some bug which have to be solved. Uh, I will look into that and we'll continue the demonstration of the uh, descriptor wallet on the next presentation. And for now, I will proceed with the uh, explanations that I would like to give. So basically, uh, the distinction between hoarded cold wallet that I was trying to demonstrate is the following. Uh, the hot wallet produces seeds, it derives assigning accounts, I'm talking about this part, it uh, performs sign to contract tweaks when it is required and it signs PSBDs. And the thing that it needs to keep is the signing accounts, which is what normally hot wallet keeps, but additionally to that, and the stuff that is specific for client side validation world and for RGB, is the history of client-side validation and state commitments. And why this history has to be kept by a hot wallet is uh, the reason we discussed on the previous call. It. it was brought by Peter Todd. It is about the fact that different uh, malware and ransomware, it may change the history of the client-side validation data, leading you to lose your uh, assets or threatening you of losing your assets. And that's why the hot wallet make, need to make sure that the history, the commitments, it is being provided by the, uh, inside the PSBD from the cold wallet, really match the information that it knows from the past. And that's why we need to keep this client-side validation state commitment, not the whole client-side validation data, but just commitments to this data. And on the other side, the cold wallet uh, tracks the balances it produces partially signed Bitcoin transactions. It uh, does uh, pay to contract tweaks uh, when it requires. That means that it needs to track that information. And it finalizes partially signed Bitcoin transactions and publishes them to the network. And to do that, uh, it needs to a set of tracking accounts, like I was showing that we produced. It needs a wallet descriptor to construct proper addresses and outputs from the tracking accounts, if more than one is used. It you need to uh, keep a uh, tweak information, and also it needs to keep a track of what I call contract identities. It, it, these are basically other public keys participating in the multi-seq wallet descriptors, which are not owned by you. So you basically know that this extended public key is belonging to that other signer. You don't know the uh, private key matching that uh, public key, but still you have to know information about that extended public key to produce a proper uh, output descriptors and track the information on check chain. And the way the uh, cold and hot wallet uh, uh, exchange the information is that cold wallet sends a partially signed Bitcoin transaction, unsigned Bitcoin transaction, but it's still called partially signed Bitcoin transaction, even though it has no signatures yet. But additionally to that, because it's the only thing that you send uh, to the hot wallet in the normal Bitcoin world. With the client-side validation, there are two other parts that should be embedded into this PSBT file. And these are client-side validated data that are used by Hot Wallet to create this history record. And also a pay-to-contract uh, tweaking information uh, from uh, the previous uh, tweaks that were applied to this output such that the Hot Wallet can produce a proper signature. And uh, on the other way around, when the hot wallet signs the PSBT, it doesn't return a single PSBT as it usually does in the Bitcoin world. It has to attach to it a produced signed to contract proofs, if any, if there were any, such that cold wallet can uh, maintain and keep this information as a part of client validated data that are held, sent to other parties and are made a part of the RGB history. So basically, that's how we modify this uh, workflow and we introduce a special fields into PSBT covering this specific data. Uh, today, we will probably not have a time to cover, go through all of that. So I will leave this part for the next presentation. And 
With all this information, basically, I have a summary of all new wallet data structures that uh, some of them are already used by other wallets, but some of them are introduced by descriptor wallets uh, to deal with uh, the cases which are specific to client-side validated data and tweaks. So we have a seed gain, which we had uh, originally uh, based off mnemonic. We have assigning accounts that derives up to the end of the card and derivation path. And basically the signing account is extended private key with this derivation information coming from the seed. The tracking accounts, which uh, is ex public equivalent of this private key plus the derivation terminal path with the asterisk. So you may have something different like this one. The most important that there is no hardened derivation path components after the extended public key. Uh, the wallet descriptors, which may be built of different tracking accounts using different combinations and multi six. Here, TA stands for this part of the tracking account from the previous row. And these are kind of two different uh, accounts composing a single multi sig There are terminals and tweaks which are kept by the wallet specifying a particular derivation terminal path used to produce a public key and a tweak applied to a fingerprint of a specific tracking account. There are output descriptors, which are getting all this information about terminal into with the tweaks and all the information into a specific descriptor. And it put descriptors that are reach, reaching this information with the RBF uh, and uh, Ccash uh, type information. So this, this, I know that this is quite complicated and complex. And as I said, uh, at least this differentiation is not done by any existing wallet. This part is done only by a BDK, and this part is also is not done by any existing wallet. So yes, Descriptor Wallet introduced quite a lot of um, advanced uh, low level stuff that allows you to work with the client side validated data. Uh, the next part is about PTC and sign to contract tweaks. But again, I see that we are quite late today and it, it will take about at least one hour more. Uh, so I propose to split this uh, presentation into two parts and continue next time with a finalizing the demo that I haven't finalized today because of the bug and uh, completing the part on the pay to contract and sign to contract tweak. And today I propose to proceed to the questions and I will be happy to answer them. Answer them. How can you now make sure that the 20 francs, which is a huge amount of money, uh, are not being stolen, are not stolen from the wallet, taking into account the seed phrase, which is out well, there. <laughs> the seed phrase is not yet out there. It was quickly shown on the screen, and I assume that nobody watching the talk was able to make a screenshot. And before the video is published, nobody will be able to spend it. But even if somebody can do that, you will have to do all the derivation, which is not that trivial with existing wallet software. So it will be a challenge. Can you use existing wallets to spend that money from that particular derivation path? Okay, I think now that things are getting interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for the presentation for the demo. Uh, Francisco left the call, but he was asking uh, if you could update the readme with the compilation instructions. Uh, yes, well, probably we should do that. Uh, well, we'll again, there's a temporary compilation instruction because once we will publish this uh, version, they will be different, but I think it will take some time to publish it because we depend on Rust Bitcoin uh, Taproot support being finalized, which I think will take some other months. So basically for this descriptor wallet, uh, we had to do a um, uh, Bit Rust Bitcoin fork. Uh, we've been waiting for about a year with all the upward specific parts to be mer merged and it doesn't happen so that soon because it requires proper uh, peer review. Uh, so we decided that we, we can't wait any, any longer. So we basically created a fork uh, of Rust Bitcoin and just merged all Taproot-related PRs uh, as they are 
right now. And we are using that custom version of Rust Bitcoin and Rust Miniscript on top of that to have this uh, Taproot supporting wallet. Uh, there is no other way to do it today for any other wallet, unfortunately. So before the Rust Bitcoin release, we can't release the Descriptor wallet uh, because uh, we need non-forked non version of it for the release. Uh, so it will take a few more months, as I expect. And for the, before that time, probably the proper compilations instruction, compilation instructions will be required. So we will add them to the readme. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, the question is, what's your opinion on what kind of seed words to use? Some people swear on using 24 words these days. Well, Descriptor Wallet can, can, um, uh, supports all combinations. Like there are four combinations as far as I know. I can just look into it if we see the source code of the Descriptor Wallet. It may be interesting to look into it. Uh, it's actually um, inside the... Uh, the, 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 the which directory is it? Probably I will use Midnight Commander to uh, walk through that. Um, Skip part. Life. Yeah, iPad is not that simple as uh, as a normal um, terminal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's not that simple. But anyway, um, we support many of them, like. 12 words, 16, 20, 24, and 15, as far as I remember. So basically, Descriptor Wallet allows you to work with any of them. Basically, it is thought that 12 words is enough for producing the entropy. And I also think that the complexity introduced by having more word, words, words is not worth uh, the security gain. Because with more words, you get more ways of misspelling them, or losing part of them and so on and so forth. So I think 12 works, uh, words uh, still should work. At least for myself, I'm using 12 words. And again, it's better to have a mnemonic that is widely compatible with all existing wallets. And the most compatible is 12 wor words variant. Any other questions? Yeah, it seems that people do not have any questions left. At least for now. Yeah, it was a bit complex uh, presentation, of course. But it's, at least, I, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a shame that, uh, as usually, the bug appeared because I think, well, me personally, I was very looking forward to seeing what will happen. Well, as, as always, I was creating the transaction by myself before that, and everything worked. So, but I was doing that on my laptop, not iPad, uh, with the server. So I don't know what mm -hmm. what's is missed here and why it's not working as expected. So, Indeed. But yes, I, I will look well, into that. And yeah, we can try next time or like in between and record the demo once again. Yeah. That's not a problem. Um, the Bitcoin wallet breakdown part was amazing, Maxime. That's uh, one of the comments from. Oh, thank from you. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. And I, I do agree. Uh, the slides will be available. Soon-ish, I mean, Once we tomorrow, spend today, to today. some other <laughs> phrase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, the slides would be available. 
pretty soon. Uh, I post, so in case you don't know, there is an RGB FAQ website where we have the dev calls uh, page and I put all the information regarding the agenda and the links uh, like every time I have a call. Uh, I also have the presentations repository under the LNPVP Standards Association organization on GitHub. So just go there and you can see, you can find the presentations repository and just, just I don't know, slide th through there. And the slides would be there again. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have, uh, guys, if you are still thinking about the questions, uh, I have a question from three call of from probably like two, three calls back. Maxine, would you be okay? Yes, with yes. Answering? Why not? Why not? Uh, let me find it. I have it somewhere here. Yes, so the question was, uh, the, um, the question was, RGB will be a channel application type or not? And whether it will be running inside Alluvium and so will be written in Aluasm or in Contractum or it will be kept as it is? Well, I'm not sure that I don't entirely understand the question, but... Uh, maybe it's the other way around. So RGB is not uh, something inside the channel and not based by Alluvium, but vice versa. RGB may use channels and will use Alluvium to do the validation, but it's more a generic thing than just Alluvium or channels. Like it's asking, is Bitcoin a part of Lightning Network? No, vice versa. It's Lightning Network. Something is built on top of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so three call of this was uh, your question. I know it's been a while since we've had time and probably you already forgot what it was about. But uh, if you need more comments, just ask me or drop a message here. Have we had a presentation on the world of key tweaking yet? I'm not sure what you mean, but uh, I'm intended to say no. Well, we, we had a lot of presentation on the topic, starting from the ones uh, quite a long time ago when we were doing intro into RGB. Well, first Milano conference, uh, all the recordings from there was the part where we were designing this key tweaking which was the late 2019. Then there were uh, RGB technical guideline presentations when where I was covering that for several hours. Then the last call was dedicated for the kit tweaking. And then the next call with the plenty of slides will be also touching some topics of kit tweaking. And finally, I think at some point we will have in the future call that will summarize all the single use seals and key tweaking as it will have once it will have a final form into a single presentation, uh, but that will happen in the future when it will be finalized. So that's kind of roadmap from the past to the future on the key tweaking topic. But basically the key tweaking, it's, it's a very long concept appearing before the RGB and there is a number of protocols that are using key tweaked, tweak, key tweaking, starting from elements project and liquid, basically. Uh, time stamping protocols. Um, today, this is RGB. Taproot is, it by itself is a key tweaking protocol uh, that made a key tweaking a part of Bitcoin consensus even, which actually 
still uh, that's why it's still use, simpler to use uh, work with Taproot than with RGB because here you have uh, key, key tweaking held at the level of Bitcoin core and not at the level of the wallet. And in all these cases, you have to deal with that at the wallet level. And there are also future protocols which may use uh, key tweaking as well. And the, the difference uh, between these protocols and what we do with LMPPP is that we can, we try to standardize key tweaking in more uh, universal concept uh, where you can use key tweaking with a, uh, multi with the scripts because before that you can use only with a single public key controlled outputs and inputs and it wouldn't work with uh, RGB this way because otherwise we wouldn't be able to put RGB into lightning network so we had to generalize it into covering all possible scripts and top root and everything like that and that's why we ended up uh, with having a set of standards related to key tweaking which extend uh, the key tweaking original concepts to a lot more like LMPPP 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 6, 10, many, many others because basically like um, there is a lot of problems appearing when you try to generalize on scripts and that will be also problems. That was the problems we were discussing on the previous call and this will be a problems we will be discussing on the next call as well. So, and last call for questions. Probably we can wrap this up for today then. Thank, Thank you for you, being everybody. here, guys. Thank you for a great presentation and demo, Maxim. Thank you. See you around in two weeks, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.